Public education is the cornerstone of our democracy. Public education belongs to the people, not to the mayor, not to the business community, and not to the Gates Foundation. Public education is not perfect. It needs to be improved. It needs to be improved every day. It needs continuous improvement. But we don't hear much about that scenario. The media has swallowed the narrative of the corporate reformers hook, line, and sinker. The media loves the idea of competition, of winners and losers, even if it's our children who are divided into winners and losers. The media loves the idea of firing people, of putting teachers and principals into the public stocks and humiliating them. Maybe they had a teacher who put them down when they were little, now they're getting even. The big foundations love the shock doctrine. It puts them in the driver's seat and the frantic search for that ever elusive thing, that shimmera called innovation. The biggest foundations are now calling the shots and they're accountable to no one. When they dangle a few million dollars or a hundred million dollars, school districts line up and ask, how high should we jump to get the money? The Wall Street hedge fund managers love the shock doctrine. They made their money by competition, by playing with data, by offshoring their losses, as Enron did, they had the books with the profits and another set of books that no one saw with the losses. They had great data right up until the day they went bankrupt. But the, the hedge fund managers understand buying and selling and watching the rate of return on investment and now they have the power to inflict this doctrine on our public schools. They say that school districts should treat their schools as a portfolio of investments. Bet on the winners, sell off the losers. The hedge fund managers like that. They understand it. They also love charter schools because they like the odds. They get public funds, they hold a lottery, motivated families apply, and the school pushes out the low performing kids. And the hedge fund managers get the glory of they can tell their friends they're saving poor children from the public schools. It's a win-win proposition. Well, no wonder that Bill Gates and Eli Broad of the Broad Foundation and the Walton Family Foundation, the Dell Foundation, and a lot of mil billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires that you never even heard of, are excited about the, this new frontier of school reform. They become heroes on the public's dime. Their goal is privatization, putting control of public dollars in the hands of the private sector. And the media buys it, and so does Secretary Duncan and the Obama administration, unfortunately. So now we have this, it's all coming together. It started happening this September where all the pieces fell into line with the release of this movie. Uh, the Waiting for Superman had a tremendous amount of publicity. Oprah gave it two segments. Time Magazine gave it the cover. NBC, which is owned by Viacom, which also owns Waiting for Superman, gave it a week of television prime time. The president invited the five children who were featured in the film to the White House. And what, what does this movie say? Privatization is good. Who are the producers? Well, in addition to Viacom, there's a company called Participant Media. The CEO of Participant Media was previously CEO of a chain of for-profit vocational colleges. And you know, the whole for-profit sector is being investigated by Congress right now for its abuses. The other major producer is called Walden Media. The owner of that company funds conservative libertarian think tanks that advocate for privatization charters and vouchers. The only two experts quoted in the movie come from conservative think tanks and advocate for privatization charters and vouchers. So the narrative of the movie is our public schools are failing, poverty doesn't matter, resources don't matter, Teachers alone are responsible for test scores. And how do you know that poverty doesn't matter and resources don't matter? Well, the movie explains it very simply. They have a film clip of a jet pilot named Chuck Yeager. And they said, you know, people used to say that a jet couldn't possibly break the sound barrier. And then you see Chuck Yeager and his jet broke the sound barrier. And that proves that poverty doesn't matter and resources don't matter. <laughs> If Chuck Jager could do it, then you know we can do anything. 
So another of the answer that this answers that the movie offers, other than resources don't matter and poverty doesn't matter. Is there anyone here who has too many resources in their school? No? Do you think resources matter? Yes. Okay, do you think poverty matters? Yes. Okay, just wanted to get clear about that. Thank you. Another of the answers presented in this film is that merit pay would make a huge difference. Teachers should be paid more if they get higher scores and fired if they don't. And they have an expert who says, from a conservative think tank, if we could only fire f six to 10% of teachers every year who ha whose students have low scores, we'll rise to the top of the international comparison charts. Now, I quite, don't quite get the logic of this, but nonetheless, that argument is presented, and there are a lot of, of these corporate reformers who believe it. And of course, the charter schools are presented as the answer because the five children who are desperate to get out of public schools are desperate to get into charter schools. So what I did in my review is some fact checking. And I'd like to share some of these facts with you. The movie asserts that 70% of eighth grade students in this country are reading below grade level. That's wrong. It's not true. Uh, they're using the achievement levels from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I was a member of the board there for seven years, and the uh, NAEP does not report grade, le grade levels. So to say that anyone's below grade level based on NAEP is simply wrong. What, what the, the director didn't understand is what the, the achievement levels mean. The highest achievement level on the NAEP is advanced. Only a very tiny number of kids are advanced. These are the kids who, if they took an SAT, would be 750 to 800. They're the tip-top students. I'd call them the A-plus students. The second achievement level is proficient. These are students who are A students, very strong B students. The third level is basic. Basic is what we would probably say was a C level of achievement. Below basic is not 70%, it's 25%. That's the kids that he mean, refers to when he talks about below grade level. Not 70%, 25%, and that includes children who don't speak English, who are learning English, and children with special needs. But you know, you couldn't make much of a dramatic movie if you went to the public and said 25% of our children are scoring below basic. 70% looks like a crisis. The crisis in this case was completely distorted and overblown. Now, the... The movie says, of course, that poverty doesn't matter. And I think it's worth everybody bearing in mind just how terrible child poverty is in this country. 20% of our children live in poverty. This puts us in a league with countries like Mexico and Turkey. We compare ourselves to countries in Asia and Europe where child poverty levels are under 5%. The, movie that, the uh, country that's held up as an example to us in this film is Finland where the poverty level is under 5%. In this country, it's 20%, and it's on its way by mid-decade to 26%. This is a shame. It's a disgrace. Now, the movie complains that we don't fire enough teachers. Uh, the director has a graph, and he shows that in some state in the Midwest, uh, they take the license away from one out of every 57 doctors or lawyers, but only one out of 2,500 teachers gets decertified. This is supposed to prove to you that we're not firing enough teachers. But what he doesn't mention is that 50% of the people who enter teaching leave within five years. You don't hear that about medicine and law. They don't have 50% leaving within five years. If bad teachers get tenure, they didn't give themselves tenure. We have a problem. The problem is maybe we have too many bad administrators, but they don't mention that. Now, the problem he also doesn't talk about is this. We have something, something close to 4 million teachers in this country, and every year, 9% of them leave. That's 360,000 teachers that leave the classroom and must be replaced. Now, imagine that we were to fire, as they recommend, 6 to 10% more each year. That means that we're going to need, every year, between 500,000 and 750,000 new teachers, which may even be higher because of the retirement of the baby boom generation. So here's the news to Washington. TFA can't fill the gap. 
TFA, TFA bring, Teach for America brings in 10,000 or fewer teachers every year, and we need a minimum of 360,000. And guess how many graduates there are in all the colleges in the United States? 1.5 million a year. Well, virtually everybody who graduates college is going to have to become a teacher at the rate we're going. <laughs> the question is, how will it take us to the top to have all of this instability and this constant influx of brand new teachers? This is not sensible. This is insane. I was in Texas a couple of weeks ago and uh, passed by billboards that said, do you want to be a teacher? Do, you know, go to this website. And I went to the website and it said, if you put $400 down, you can get your certification and be a teacher. <laughs> Texasteachers.org, Google it and for $4,000, you're certified. <laughs> you know, this, is, this should not be the future of the teaching profession. Now, the, the movie argues that resources don't matter, but it makes the mistake of using the Harlem Children's Zone to make that claim. I think the Harlem Children's Zone does a wonderful job of addressing wraparound services, the social needs, the medical needs of the community, of families, of children. Whether it affects test scores or not, it doesn't matter. People have needs. They should be addressed. This is the right thing to do. So that's a good thing. But here's the thing about Harlem Children's Zone. It has a very, very powerful board of financiers. It has assets of over $200 million. Anybody here work in a school that has assets of over $200 million? I don't think so. See, the thing is, and this is the big secret, resources don't matter if you already have them.